Did the US government just guarantee to keep Bitcoin legal? Well, one of the main things I hear from people that don't believe in Bitcoin is that the government's just gonna make it illegal, but things that just happen might actually tell you the opposite, which is why I am about to have on Dennis Porter. Dennis Porter is the co-founder and chairman of Satoshi Action Fund. It's a nonprofit educational organization dedicated to informing policymakers and regulators in DC and around the country about Bitcoin, about Bitcoin mining, the benefits, how it can be used as a tool to support other public policy goals and so much more. If you wanna know what's going on with politics and what bills just got passed and potentially President Biden might try to veto or overturn, then you wanna hear this conversation. This is going to be an enlightening conversation with someone who is in the trenches working with policymakers, lawmakers every day. Let's go ahead and just jump right into the interview with Dennis Porter. All right, Dennis Porter, the CEO and co-founder of the Satoshi Action Fund, president and founder of Satoshi Action Education uh, for Bitcoin Advocacy. Uh, Dennis is regularly testifying in support of Bitcoin and digital asset policy, developing really key, uh, innovative, first of its kind policy across the United States, advancing Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, and the right to own digital assets. Uh, Dennis, thanks so much for joining me today. Mark, it's an honor to, to be back on the show with you and uh, excited to chat about all things Bitcoin and digital assets. Yeah, man, it's been a while and uh, there has been a lot of stuff going on. So I'm super excited to catch up. But the first question, let's just dive right into this, Dennis. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that I've heard for the last, whatever it is now, seven, eight years I've been talking about Bitcoin is like almost like the single biggest thing is like the government's going to make it illegal. And so the first question I want to ask is, did it just become legalized? I, I mean, that's probably a very good way to categorize what is taking place in Washington, D.C. Um, even myself, I'm a little surprised by the, the amount of momentum that is picked up here uh, for what we, we should call rightfully call digital asset policy in the United States. Um, although I care predominantly about Bitcoin, uh, it is good to see digital asset policy that it will uh, lift all boats, you know, rising tide lifts all boats in the space. Uh, we're very fortunate to see the progress we have. Now, that being said, right, like we, we still have a lot, of, uh, a lot of room to go, so to speak, with regards to passing this legislation into law. I mean, there's some major hurdles that we got to overcome. I'm sure we can get into it, uh, but it's a very exciting time in the world of Bitcoin and digital asset policy. And I'm looking forward to seeing the United States create these necessary regulatory guidelines we need in order to really benefit from this technology. Oh, you, you said a lot there that I'm ready to unpack into. So first of all, do we need these regulations to give us clear guidelines? We're going to come back to that. Uh, but let's stop. Let's just stop uh, or start with did Bitcoin just become legalized? So to the point that you made, there's still a lot that has to be done. So we had bills that just got passed by the House. Uh, they still have to get through the Senate, I believe. Um, so that's probably a lot of the work still has to be done. There's another bill that um, has gotten overturned and now potentially the, the president could veto this. So I want to kind of dig into a little bit of the nuance. So I guess let's just start with at the top. Uh, in your opinion, you've been doing this now for a couple of years. You're <laughs> deep in the belly of the beast. Let's just call it that um, in, the, in, the, in the politics world. Um, it seems like this has uh, become very bipartisan. The sides are opposite of each other, although these latest bills seem to be, I'm sorry, bipartisan. This latest bill seems like everyone's kind of together, but there's some stuff that seems more partisan where they're fighting. And so let's just frame it up from a top level. So, you know, at the Bitcoin conference last year, almost a year ago right now, uh, we saw presidential candidates, Vivek Ramaswamy, RFK, uh, even Tulsi Gabbard, not a, not a candidate, but kind of a, a front running political figure, all coming out in support of Bitcoin and digital assets. Uh, just uh, maybe a week ago or so, Donald Trump uh, sort of came out in support of, of digital assets and cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, even accepting donations. And it sort of maybe puts the opposition, the Biden administration, on the opposite side of this. Um, so let me frame this up, tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems like the Biden administration, Elizabeth Warren, Gary Gensler, has been very, very, very against cryptocurrencies, very harsh on them. Um, but the tide seems to be turning. And now, does Biden have to, do you think he has to take the opposite side of Trump because they're competing? Or do you think Biden's going to be, the, the Biden admin will be forced to sort of capitulate and just, just realize that they're going to lose voting base if they do that? That's an absolutely great question. Um, as someone who's been fighting for a long time to make sure that Democrats and progressives also see the value of Bitcoin and digital assets, um, I, I couldn't, you know, more disagree that like the Biden administration needs to take this like opposite stance, although that is just very stereotypically what we do see in politics. So I wouldn't be surprised if it does happen. Uh, but I'm really excited about this opportunity for 
both sides of the aisle to be fighting for the Bitcoin vote. I, I see it very much like the same way as like, you know, who's best on the economy, right? It's not gonna be like, who, like oh, I'm pro-Bitcoin, you're anti-Bitcoin. It is, who's better on Bitcoin? And we're moving towards that world. We're not quite there yet, so we could see the Biden administration take some missteps on this issue. Uh, but predominantly, I really see it as an, as an Elizabeth Warren uh, give, being given a mandate at, through the elections, this is actually like a well-known DC secret that during the election process, when Biden was trying to win that, when trying to win the, the office of the presidency, uh, he cut a deal with Elizabeth Warren to let her to like manage some of this banking and digital asset stuff. And obviously, it's been very, very bad for the administration. So you know, we could see a pivot. There's a lot of people talking about that there could be a pivot, and the reason why is because at the end of the day. Everybody's going to be pro Bitcoin, and it's only a matter of time until both Democrats and Republicans are fighting to be number one on the issue. All right, I want to take a break just real quick and say that, you know, as we're talking about Bitcoin and digital assets, uh, the question really comes down to like, are you tired of the global elites robbing you blind through, you know, all this money printing that's happening? And if so, then you need to be holding your wealth outside of that. And more importantly, you should be coming to the Bitcoin conference in Nashville. The 2024 conference is happening July 25th through 27th. It's the largest Bitcoin, the largest fintech conference in the world. Um, I've been going every single year. It's an amazing event. And Bitcoin 2024 really stands as a beacon of monetary freedom. If you care about that, if you care about freedom, all freedom sits at the freedom to transact. And really the darkening macroeconomic backdrop that's happening needs the Bitcoin more than ever. Now there's gonna to be top speakers there, companies, thought leaders from across the industry. They're all gonna be in Nashville uh, looking ahead for the future. And I'm gonna be there, lots of other people, my friends are gonna be there and ticket prices keep going up. So the longer you wait, the more you're gonna pay, but I don't want that to happen to you. I'd love for you to come hang out, meet me, hang out with me and all the other speakers there. And you can save 10% on your ticket by using code Mark Moss at checkout. So get your tickets now. Like I said, the prices just keep going up. Use Mark Moss at checkout to save 10% on your tickets and hit me up. Let me know if you're coming. So I want to meet you. And also while we're talking about Bitcoin, we're talking about laws being changed to basically guarantee your rights of self-custody. The whole piece about Bitcoin that's so revolutionary is that we can custody our own digital asset. And so you should certainly do that. But how? I've been using this device. It's called a Trezor hardware wallet. I've been using it for about seven, eight years now. It's been my go-to device. Basically, it's a little hardware device like this that holds your private key and you plug it into your computer when you want to send a transaction. I like Trezor because it's open source, unlike some of the security flaws you've seen in other devices. Uh, I don't want to name them right now, but it's open source so you know that it's safe. Uh, it's the easiest to use, which I have used it forever. They have new devices that uh, make it much easier than ever before. There's no excuse for you not to secure your own Bitcoin with a Trezor hardware wallet or something else like that. And more importantly, when you're um, holding your Trezor hardware wallet or any hardware wallet for that matter, you need to back up your private keys. Now, you wanna make sure that you back up your private keys and uh, put them somewhere they don't get destroyed. And they've come up with this new device where I can put my private key on this metal device that could withstand fl fire, flood, or war, whatever it may be. So check out Trezor, what they're doing. Um, you can save 10% on these things by using code Mark Moss. Uh, but either way, make sure you um, secure your own Bitcoin. I like how you frame that, how we should just argue who's better on it as opposed to trying to take opposite sides of that. I just, I, I you know, there's the, the never Trumpers and no matter what he wants, he wants to secure the border. They don't want to secure the, it's like, unfortunately we're in this bipolar world where we have to, but hopefully, hopefully you're right on that. I find it odd that in the land of the free in the United States, any politician could run on a platform to take away our freedom of choice. I just find it hard. How could somebody run on that platform? It, it amazes me. Um, so I want to dig deeper into that, but let's start on, on some of these uh, specifics here. So uh, a big news for you in the Satoshi Action Fund was what happened in Oklahoma. So Oklahoma took the, I, I, I believe, I want you to break this down for me, but it appears that Oklahoma basically sort of uh, put the rights in to, man, to make sure that the Oklahoma citizens, I guess at least, uh, have the right to have Bitcoin, own it, custody, it, et cetera. Is that what happened? Yeah, that is what happened. Um, for those that might be new to the work that we do at Satoshi Action, we are a Bitcoin digital asset advocacy organization. We work to pass uh, pro-Bitcoin bills into law after we go through the education process with lawmakers. We help them understand the value of the technology. And then we move and say, hey, now that you like Bitcoin as much as we do, here's some ideas for how you can attract this new technology to your jurisdiction. Um, last year, we passed our uh, two bills into law in Montana and Arkansas called the Right to Mind Bill. And this year, we they decided to say, hey, 
We got a couple wins on the board. Bitcoin is gonna, about to go on a run. Uh, the sentiment is changing dramatically and we should really take advantage of that and try to expand the scope of the policy. So now not only are we protecting Bitcoin mining with our legislation, we are also protecting the right to self-custody, the right to run a node, and the right to buy, sell, and trade, and, and use digital assets broadly. And so the first state in the country to actually enact that bill into law is Oklahoma. It did it just a little over a week ago, so very excited about that news. But there are other states as well that are, that are right behind. We have Louisiana passing it in the House and the Senate, and we're just waiting for it to go to the governor's desk now. So very, very exciting things happening. And that's, by, that's by the way, that's, uh, that's a little bit of breaking news too, because that, uh, that hasn't been widely reported. So excited to share that with your audience here today. But yes, the right to self-custody and use Bitcoin is now protected in Oklahoma. And, and, and to, real quickly, because people oftentimes, they say, well, why, do, why should we care about state law when you have the federal law going on? Isn't federal law sort of the ultimate uh, sort of power in the USA? And to some extent, that is true. Uh, but the most important thing to keep in mind is that when you have a lack of federal action, state law reigns supreme. But let's say even, for instance, the, the federal law decides to come in and say, well, we're going to ban self-custody. If the state of Oklahoma protects self-custody, then it means it's on the onus is on the federal government to come in and enforce that policy. And just throughout history, we have seen the federal government is unwilling to enforce uh, you know, granular types of individual policies like that, where they'd have to come and knock on everybody's doors. The really clear line example of this is the cannabis industry. The cannabis industry is legalized in about 75% of the country. We do not see the federal government coming and knocking on doors and taking out every individual user and uh, cannabis indus industry business participant. Um, they just aren't doing it. And so we're following that same strategy and so far it has worked for the cannabis industry and we believe that it will work for us as well. Yeah, that's a really good example, a good analogy. Um, so the way that I see this bill, and I like it, and going back to, I said we'll come back to, um, do we need the government to give us laws to give us clarity on this? And so, you know, I'm under the, uh, again, being an American, uh, I I'm under the belief that we are free, and we're free to do whatever we want unless there's laws that tell us we can't do those things. Um, and so the Constitution is really a set of laws that prohibits the government from taking away our freedoms, encroaching on our freedoms. And, and so rather than saying, hey, please give us a law that tells us what we can do with our digital assets, that's a slave mindset. Um, instead, we pass laws that prevent the government from encroaching. And that seems sort of what this Oklahoma bill is. It's like, hey, we're putting a law into place that guarantees your right to keep these freedoms and doesn't allow the government to encroach it. Is that a way to sort of look at this? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The work that we do, I oftentimes tell people, you know, if you like the Constitution, then you should like the bill that we passed in a law in Oklahoma. You should like the bills that we passed in a law in Montana and Arkansas. And you should love the bills that we're going to pass in a law in Louisiana and others coming up here in the future. Uh, but at the end of the day, like, let's go to the heart of that question. Like, why do we need regulations? Ultimately, in the United States, given the current dynamic that we're in, it is really important to have clear rules of the road so that people can know how to operate. I mean, think about it like li quite literally like the road, right? When we're all driving around, if there was no speed limits, you'd have just this like very wide range of different driving habits. Um, and that would be make driving on the road much more difficult. And although it does, you know, in some ways slightly restrict our freedoms to create regulations, what the most important part for people to keep in mind is it creates a super highway for good behavior, a super highway for people to know, okay, this is what I can do and I know that I can do it and they're not gonna mess with me and I can go as fast as I possibly can and I can you know, move, move fast and break things, so to speak, Sim similar to the tech industry, right? We, when we create uh, regulatory guidelines for the tech industry, we've seen a super highway of good behavior and obviously, of course, we're trying to limit that bad behavior and we're trying to do it in a way where we, we don't limit to the extent that it actually crushes innovation or crushes freedom. Obviously, on the edges, you're going to see a little bit of that, um, but the most important part to keep in mind is that it really does create this mega highway for people to be able to go and pursue certain businesses that they know for sure are going to last and be here to stay for good in the United States. Great. Uh, let's uh, let's dig into a couple specifics because it's been a busy week. There's a lot of stuff going on. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about, my opening question was, did Bitcoin just become legalized? Obviously, in Oklahoma, you've already kind of covered that piece, but there's a uh, fit 21. Right. And so this uh, just went through um, the House passed. It hasn't gone through the Senate yet. 
Uh, but it seems like this uh, big watershed moment, if you will, uh, congressional validation for the crypto industry, digital asset industry, if you will. And it seemed pretty bipartisan. It was like 279 to 136, uh, Democrats and Republicans together. Um, some say the odds in the Senate remain low. Uh, before I get into the details of that, I mean, what, what's the word on the street? Is, is the odds of getting through the Senate low? And if so, why? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you, you, you sort of um, need to keep your, I think, perspectives and your expectations in check with regards to this thing going through the Senate. I think you're, you're right to do that. Um, first of all, there's just there's no companion bill in the Senate. Typically, what you will see um, if you have a really, really good effort going is you will see a companion bill where there's a matching bill on the, on the opposite side uh, in the other chamber. So if it's the House, you have a companion bill in the Senate. If it's going through the Senate, you have a companion bill in the House. There is no companion bill right now. Um, and also, there's just really no constraints on when the Senate has to act. So the Senate could just sit around and there's no there's no forcing mechanism to make them actually uh take this bill and run it through their side. Um, and also, a, a one really key thing to keep in mind here is that you have the Lummis and Gillibrand effort, right, on the Senate side. And they have been working diligently. I mean, Senator Lummis has been putting in uh, a significant portion of her time. She's the ultimate Bitcoin champion in Washington, D.C. And, she, you know, typically when you've spent that much time on a policy, you're not just going to be like, oh, yeah, let's go with the other guy's policy. Like, you're going to want some piece of the action. You're going to want to feel like your work was included. And that Fit 21, unfortunately, does not encompass all of the, the parts. I think that Senator Lummis would really want included in her bill. But but um, so, but sticking to the sticking to the odds here, you know, it's not a it's a non-zero chance, right? Like it's it's not zero, but it's not also probably 50% or higher that it's going to get through. Um, and then again, at the end of the day, you also have to be you know consider that uh, President Biden is in opposition to this legislation. He he did not announce that he was going to veto it, uh, but he did say that he would be opposed to the legislation itself. So some of the key points that I like, and going back to did it get like Bitcoin get legalized? I mean, obviously we talked about Oklahoma, but in this specifically. Um, I, I put out a pretty long tweet thread on this the other day because I, along with a lot of other people, seem to think that the probably the most likely attack vector on Bitcoin will be self-custody. And of course, this is what uh, Oklahoma law enshrines that right to do that. But in this bill specifically, there was a protection of self-custody. And so it basically protecting the rights of individuals to use hardware, software wallets, store digital assets, things like that. Um, and so that was sort of the like, man, if this goes through, it's basically legalizing Bitcoin. Um, the one thing that it just seems insane if most people don't really understand the way the world works, but because we're in a debt-based monetary system, everything in this world is debt. And they've basically taken away our rights to own anything. So things that you think you own legally, technically you don't. So like the money in your bank, you don't own that money in the bank. It's owed to you. The money is owed to you. That's why the, the bank tells you what you can do. The stocks that you own, your Apple, Tesla, et cetera, you don't own those. Those are owed to you by your broker. We used to have stock certificates. They were bearer instruments. No longer. It's owed to you now. And Bitcoin is sort of this last bearer instrument that we have, and it seems like they don't want us to own that either. Uh, they want us to have that owed to us through some debt obligation. Um, this would enshrine our rights to do that, uh, but I guess maybe that's why there's opposition to this. I don't know. What are your thoughts or what are you hearing? I mean, that's a fantastic way to, to think about it, that we live in this society and in, and in a world where everything is, is given to a custodian for them to hold on our behalf. And I mean, we have very good um, custodial services here in the United States. I won't complain. I mean, if you go to other parts of the world, there's just, you know, there are parts of the world where if you put your money into a bank account, that money will get immediately taken out by the government. So we are very fortunate to have good custodians here. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're right. We as Americans, we, the people, uh, should have the right to hold our own assets and to be able to control our own destinies. And that's why we put self-custody protections into the Oklahoma bill. That's why I love to see that the self-custody protections are also similar uh, in their effort to protect self-custody in this FIT21 bill. Um, and that's going to be big moving forward because that is, as you said, a big, big, big attack vector uh, potentially on Bitcoin. Because if you can't hold Bitcoin, if you can't truly engage with the technology, then you are sort of cut off from uh, being able to benefit from the greatest uh, opportunities that Bitcoin has to offer with regards to enhancing our freedom and our economic mobility. So yes, absolutely could, could, couldn't agree with you more that I'm probably most excited 
about this part. I mean, because it, it, ultimately, like, you know, the whole digital asset ecosystem is super pumped. Like, oh, we're going to have these great guidelines for what can the SEC do? What can the CFTC do? They're going to create this really big 90-day deadline where the SEC has to respond uh, to say that it's a security or not. And then if it's not, it goes to the CFTC instead of just like making these people wait forever and eternity and doing regulation through enforcement. So that's big, but like, I'm a Bitcoiner. I don't really like, everyone's pretty clear that Bitcoin is a commodity. It's going to go to the CFTC, uh, regardless of the lack of regulation on the issue currently. I just don't feel concerned about my Bitcoin at this point, but things like self custody protections, Absolutely, that's a huge one. And, and I'm glad that not only did you highlight it on your Twitter, that was a great breakdown that you gave, gave there, uh, but that we're highlighting it here as well. Now, on the other side, so this is st stuff that the House is doing, but we don't know if the Senate's going to do it. Um, there's no um, companion bill to your point, and there's no deadline for the Senate to move, but the Senate is doing something on the other side. So in uh, Resolution 109, the Senate's passed legislation to overturn a previous SEC accounting rule, uh, SAB uh, number 121, uh, which basically prevents regulated financial firms from custody in Bitcoin. So it's still sort of this custody piece. And that was put in place that said, hey, they can't custody it. Um, and that's like this big battleground. The Senate voted um, sort of bipartisan to overturn that, um, which seems pretty positive, again, in favor of custody, this time not self-custody, but by a custodian, a bank. Um, this one seems to be, a lot of people think that the president might want to veto this. What are you hearing on the street on that? I mean, he said it himself, right? He, he, he commented that he would veto uh, the Staff Accounting Bulletin 121 to, uh, for, for whatever reason. And I, I think actually that was a very big mistake on his part because, um, you know, ultimately the digital asset ecosystem is looking for these wins. They are, have not had any wins in DC and all of a sudden you see some movement finally for the digital asset ecosystem in Washington, D.C. I mean, I have a lot of friends that have been working there. I tell them, you're doing the Lord's work, right? Because it's just like nothing is going through uh, in Washington, D.C. And all of a sudden we see this movement and it's a lot of excitement. It's it, There are much bigger things that we need to do in Washington, D.C. with regards to this issue. But, but the fact that there was something that moved forward was so valuable to the people that work there. And I, I'm telling you, man, I got friends that are just like, what's the point of life in Washington, D.C.? We're not doing anything. All, and we're, they, they were looking at the down the barrel of, you know, November 2024 thinking, I mean, we're about to go into election mode and not see anything happen until the end of the year. And then new Congress has to come in. We got to restart all these efforts. So for them to get this 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 win, which uh, from a regulatory perspective is small, but from a from a momentum and from a uh, from a from an opportunity perspective, was huge for them uh, to really start to get wins on the board for all their efforts and for like the Biden administration to come in like snatch snatch what is it's not a big like huge massive like world changing victory but it was a victory and it was historical so for them to try to say we're going to come in and snatch uh, this this victory from you even this tiny little win we won't let you have really mobilized those in the crypto space in the Bitcoin space. And I think that's why you're seeing the Trump administration capitalize really on this this issue and say, we're going to start uh, making sure that we take care of this industry. I don't know if he would have so strongly come out in support of the space if it wasn't for that move by the Biden administration, because it opened up a door for the Trump administration to say, you know what, we're going to take a different path on this. And now you do see quite a bit of aggressive uh, pushes for people to support Trump and the Trump administration because of this. So I do, I, 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 I'm, I don't know for sure if he's actually going to come out and veto it. I think it would be a huge mistake on his part. I think it would absolutely galvanize what is a uh, very nonpartisan or bipartisan voter base that is at the end of the day, like if you go after them, you're hurting not only their wallet, but you're hurt. You're actually going after a lot of their core values on like what we think America should be about: innovation, access to your finances. Um, with regards to Bitcoin, you know, it's like the ability to be able to custody your own asset and be able to save for the future. Um, there's obviously a million other great things about Bitcoin, uh, benefits that it has to offer, everything from banking the unbanked to financial inclusion. It's like if you're against that, like that's a pretty bad place to be in because those voters are gonna like, you know, they're gonna go to the mat to make sure that they can protect their issues. So I've always said that uh, Bitcoin and digital asset voters are some of the most um, well entrenched and motivated voters if you if you motivate them. And it looks like the Biden administration is ready to ready to motivate them against his his own party.
Now, he could just sit on this too, right? I mean, does he have to veto it right now or is there a deadline? Is there a, is there a clock counting down? There is a deadline. Um, there was like a te- there is like a technically a 10 day deadline once he re- there's like there's a few nuances around when that deadline starts. Uh, but yeah, there is there is a deadline when he have, he has to sign it or not sign it. If he doesn't sign it, then it like becomes law automatically. There's also weird rules around like but if he isn't able to make it back in time and like the clock runs out on the session, then it's considered a pocket veto. It's, it's, it's a little messy out there, but yeah, there is some regulations or rules around when he has to respond. What I really, what, what I really like is what you said about the momentum. We see the tide shifting, the tide is changing on this. And so all of a sudden uh, it went from like this Elizabeth Warren led Gary Gensler led, you know, attack on crypto. I mean, she literally ran on like an anti-crypto uh, campaign um, and started, started really cracking down, choke point 2.0, all these things. And now all of a sudden, like we're seeing the exact opposite, Oklahoma taking the state, you know, other states jumping in and enshrining those rights. And now these, these rules and laws and it, and then obviously Trump taking the other side of it. Um, Kennedy, RFK, taking the other side of it as well. And it sort of forces Biden's hands. Like, I mean, you're either going to come out and you're against uh, Americans having freedom to choose, or you're going to have to go along with it. And so it's that momentum. And even if it doesn't make it make it through in this you know, specific case, it's the momentum, it's the direction that we're going. And it seems to be very bipartisan. It seems like a lot of the Democrats are jumping ship. They don't want to go down with the with the with the sinking ship of the Democrats if they're going to be restrictive on um, on these digital asset rights. I mean, is that is that kind of your take on it? I mean, yes, absolutely. I think that for a long time we have heard that a number of Democrats in Congress are very supportive of the broader digital asset ecosystem. Some, like Senator Lovis, of course, are are extremely pro Bitcoin, champions of Bitcoin. Um, on the on the Republican side, but it's great to finally see that we, they were given a moment to uh, show how supportive they are of this space, um, and it's a it's a really big indicator of how many uh, folks support the Bitcoin and digital asset ecosystem from the left and the right hand side of the aisle, and they were they were given this opportunity to really just pick a side, and when it mattered, right? It wasn't like oh. You know, uh, maybe this isn't the right move. There was so much broad support for for this this legislation that it forced a lot of these Democrats that I think were quietly supportive to break ranks from from the party line that they had been holding for some time. And so, yes, that momentum is building quite significantly. We are a a very proud contributor to that momentum. I mean, again, one of the very big parts uh, about what we are trying to accomplish at the state level is to create that political momentum. Uh, there's a 2015 Bloomberg study which highlights that when you see a flurry of state action on an issue, you, you tend to see in a very short period of time federal action take place. And we have created a flurry of action at the state level. We have introduced legislation in over 20 different states, everything from these, these policies which enable uh, folks to be protected for self-custody, to be able to study the Bitcoin ETF, to see if the state pensions want to buy the Bitcoin ETF, to protecting nodes, to protecting Bitcoin mining. Um, and that's in over 20 states. That's, that's a large portion of, of the United States. There's a flurry of activity taking place, legislation even being passed into law. Um, when you see that type of flurry of activity, uh, you do see federal action happen more often than not. We, have, we saw it with cannabis, we saw it with gay marriage, we saw it with women's suffrage, we saw it with interracial marriage, and a number of other issues where throughout history, when the states move, the feds end up following suit and acting um, alongside them. So very proud that we've been able to contribute to that momentum. And we think that's that's a big reason why people should be working at the state level, because the laboratory of democracy is a place where we can try out new ideas and show that they work and then force the feds to, to act in good behavior. All right, hopefully you're enjoying this conversation with Dennis and you understand that, wow, we now are getting the protected right to custody around Bitcoin. And so you should certainly do that. It's what's revolutionary about Bitcoin. But how do you do that? I like to use a hardware wallet because I wanna keep my private keys off the internet. <laughs> you don't wanna use a wallet on your phone. I've done that before, I lost a lot of money. So you wanna keep them off the internet with a hardware wallet like this. It stores your private key, you plug it into your computer when you wanna sign a transaction and you unplug it and put it back into your safe. I've used 
use Trezor forever, seven, eight years now. I've always used them because I think they're the easiest to use. Their newest device is even easier. It's got a, a digital display and they're open source. So you know there's no back doors or uh, rug pulls waiting for you. I highly recommend Trezor. And then you want to back up your private key. And they came up with this new device where I can inscribe my private key on this piece of metal so it can withstand fires, flood, or anything because you want to back up your private key. Uh, check out Trezor. I've always been using them. I'm still using them today. You can save 10% by using code Mark Moss. Again, your right to custody your own Bitcoin is now being enshrined into law. You should certainly do that and use a device like Trezor. Save 10% by using um, the code Mark Moss. And while we're talking about Bitcoin, I also want to let you know that the Bitcoin conference in Nashville for 2024 is coming up. It's right around the corner. I'm going to be there. I hope that you'll be there as well. If you care about understanding Bitcoin, digital assets, freedom, understanding the problems in the world with frivolous money printing, then you need to be in the Bitcoin conference in Nashville. It's July 25th through 27th. It's the largest Bitcoin fintech conference in the world. And it's really, it's a beacon of monetary freedom. It's a, it's a glimmer of hope amongst a darkening macroeconomic backdrop. Like I said, I'm going to be there. Lots of top speakers are going to be there. Companies are going to be there. Thought leaders are going to be there. And ticket prices keep going up. And so right now, today is going to be the cheapest you can get it. And I can save you an extra 10% if you use my code Mark Moss at checkout. But like I said, ticket prices just keep going up. So don't wait, get your tickets, save 10% with code Mark Moss. And let me know, hit me up on social media if you're going to be there because I want to meet you. Yeah, I love that. Um, that's something I'm, I'm going to spend a second on that. The laboratory of democracy. I've never heard a, t a term that way, uh, but I like that. And that's when states can compete. We can find through competition. We can find out better uh, product service prices is what I typically call competition and it allows us to try different things and see what works. And so to the point that you're kind of making though, at the end, I might disagree a little bit. I mean, obviously per the constitution, the states are supposed to have the rights. The federal law is not really supposed to have much power over us on a day-to-day -day basis. Unfortunately, the federal law has been creeping, 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 and now is trying to sort of have control over the United States. But we are, we see many examples where you know, basically right down the middle, red and blue states are just dividing, you know, 26 states sign on to, uh, you know, whatever, whether it's supporting Trump, uh, whether it's actually the next point I want to talk about is the CBDs, for example. So lots of states have come out and banned ESG investing, for example, and now we have the CBDC uh, going on. And so we just saw the U.S. House passed a bill banning a federal, uh, a federal or the Federal Reserve from issuing a CBDC. And again, that seemed to be somewhat bipartisan. Well, no, that actually seemed to be very partisan, right? We had 213 Republicans, only three Democrats voted for it. 192 Democrats voted against it. So that was a extremely red and blue on that one. Do you guys work on that? What's your take on that? I mean, yeah, we spent a lot of time on CBDCs. Um, you know, generally speaking, I'm very interested in seeing um, a competition take place uh, over what would be some form of uh, dollar stable coin. Um, I don't really prefer the idea of a central ba central bank digital currency. I think that they not only inc diminish quite dramatically uh, our privacy as individuals, um, but they also just give more power to the Fed and they take that power away from Congress and from the people. And I would ra much rather see uh, a world where we have uh, US dollar backed stable coins uh, competing and, and working to be able to provide great products uh, for the American people. And we do see that taking place. Um, and ultimately, I think that at the end of the day, it's going to be a, a, a big win for the US like, uh, you know, a lot of us in the, some of us in the Bitcoin space, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm included in this group, but some of us in the Bitcoin space, you know, want to see the dollar system move away. Um, I, I think that that's, that's not going to happen anytime soon. We're going to see a massive proliferation of stable coins across the world, uh, especially as stable coins become one of the number one buyers of U.S. treasuries. The United States likes that. Not only are you getting dollars and in the hands of, of folks across the world, you are also, you know, those companies that are buying, that are offering these stable coins are turning right around and buying U.S. treasuries. I mean, Tether is like the 20th largest national holder of U.S. treasuries right behind Germany. That's pretty incredible, especially in a time when um, interest rates are rising. The fact that there is a marketplace coming in to buy uh, these treasuries, it's, it's actually suppressing those interest rates and keeping interest rates lower for Americans. So it's, it's, it's really a win-win for Americans. I think well, those of us that don't like the fiat system, obviously, you know, we want to see this transition and we want to see the system get better. I, I also think that the system does 
will get better. I don't think we necessarily need to have a, a crash landing. I think we can we can soft land this plane and and harmonize these two worlds. I think that Bitcoin ultimately can become a really powerful tool to be able to show what's going on in the economy. And at the end of the day, I think it will help keep the 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 people or the industries or the institutions overseeing that fiat system more responsible, right? Because it's like a mirror that you're looking at and it like it reflects every bad move that you make. Uh, so at the end of the day, I think Bitcoin instills more uh, monetary responsibility in governments. I think that stable coins will proliferate and that those stable coin issuers will buy U.S. treasuries and that that will help stabilize the U.S. economy and really the world. And then as more people, this is my big pitch to Bitcoiners too, is like as more people are on stable coins, they're going to buy Bitcoin. You wonder how I know that? Because the largest buyers of Bitcoin are all the people who hold U.S. dollars. Like all the Americans have all the Bitcoin. Why? Because at the end of the day, like Bitcoin, the dollar helps us to have a much more stable uh, ability to plan for the future and to be able to pay for our groceries and pay for our rent. Yes, inflation is uh, is has been raging recently. It's diminishing. But compare that to like people in Zimbabwe, compare that to people in Venezuela, compare that to people across the world with local currencies that just aren't operating at the way that they should be. Um, moving to a dollar system for them will help them transition in a better way towards Bitcoin. I mean, I've heard, you hear all the time, people going to Africa, right? people going to Latin America, you know, why don't we see this large mass adoption of Bitcoin? Because it's, it's not quite stable enough for people to like plan their groceries out and their rent out, but I think the dollar is. And then as people transition to a crypto stablecoin dollar, then from there, they're also gonna say, oh wow, in their wallet where they're looking at all the exchange rates of all the digital assets. Oh, look at this Bitcoin thing. You know what, I've actually been able to save a little better recently. I'm gonna take a little bit of my money and I'm gonna put it in Bitcoin. People need to keep in mind, this is the last point I like to make on this, I think it's really important, that the ability to save for the future and to actually save in a bank account that you know that's not gonna get pillaged is like a Western privilege. A lot of parts of Africa, a lot of parts of Latin America and the world do not have this privilege. They have unstable currencies they can't save in, and even if they do save in them, they put them in a bank account, they're gonna get pillaged. If you wanna save for a house in a lot of these places, you have to buy, like, save in bricks. You have to buy the bricks individually because you know that your local currency is not gonna maintain its value in order to pay for that house in the future. So I, I'm, I know it's a little, uh, I would say counterintuitive for some folks that wanna see Bitcoin be successful, but at the end of the day, I do really believe that as we move towards a Bitcoin world, we will see a proliferation of stable coins that really unlocks the ability for people to to buy even more Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. There's there's interim steps. I try to remind people all the time. This is a process. It's not an event. It's like we wake up one day and it happens. There's a process that happens. I think most nations, especially the rise of the BRICS, I mean, China, Russia as well, they're probably going to try and go back to gold somewhere in the meantime. I think that might be an intermediary step as well. The people more decentralized probably go to more of like a U.S. dollar stable coin. There's going to be lots of things that are being tried and tested, and there's a process that is going to take us to get there. But going back to the CBDC ban for a second, this seemed to be very partisan. It got through the House, but this still has to get through the Senate as well. Am I right on that? The CBDC ban, yes. That passed in the House, and it's probably has even less of a chance to get through the Senate. In regards to the CBDC, just a little bit, I'm just curious if, if you've dug into this a lot. I know you've probably worked on it quite a bit. Um, <laughs> In today's world, I just saw Jordan Peterson. I talked my I took my daughter to go see him a week ago. It was uh, it was amazing. And he talked about how at the end of a society where we start to think that we're too smart, uh, he he references the Tower of Babel. We can no longer understand each other anymore. And he said the story behind the Tower of Babel is that uh, they worshipped um, engineering, and it and when we get so full of conceit, we can no longer understand each other. And so today he says. Like, what's a woman? We can't understand each other anymore. And so definitions have gotten lost. And so going back to CBDC, like, what is that? So for example, 80 or about 90% of all dollar transactions are done digitally right now anyway. I don't really carry a lot of cash, right? It's all wire transfers, debit cards, et cetera. And so we're already using a digital dollar. And so could they just not call it a CBDC? Could they just keep calling it a dollar, but since it's already digital dollars anyway, they just kind of put the extra um, things in there. It runs on a different set of rails. They don't really tell us that. I mean, they can ban the word, right? But like, how intricate is the bill? And like, what exactly is it actually trying to to block? I mean, 
I would say ultimately the major problem I think that a lot of lawmakers have with CBDCs is that they are going to diminish the amount of privacy that Americans have because it will create a, a payment system where the Fed has total like access to all the data that's going on unmitigated. Um, right now, that's it's slightly different, although it's not necessarily too much better uh, in the sense that you know there's a there's a bunch of different companies that have your private information and you know what you're buying and what you're transacting on PayPal, Mastercard, Visa. Yeah, it's 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 decentralized, so to speak. I mean, of course, they probably have backdoor access to a lot of this information, and there's the third party doctrine, which enables them to uh, anybody that's if you give your the, the third party doctrine basically says if I give my information over to a third party, that the government can ask that third party for it. It's not necessarily an invasion of privacy. I mean, that's 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 it in like a very simplified form, and that's what allows the government to invade our privacy, which I think is I think I, I'm obviously opposed to third party doctrine. But the the Fed, it's like washing all that away, and just and streamlining the the capture of your your information and your data. And I, also, the second point that I think that lawmakers are most concerned about with CBDCs is that it gives this granular control over money that we've never seen before, As, and, and that would be a problem when you get someone into power that you don't agree with, like. Like as an example, I mean, we've had administrations before who have said has th threatened to like kick people out of the financial system. So the CBDCs would just blow that power up and <laughs> what enable. Do, what do you mean threaten? What do you mean threaten? My friend, yeah. Joe, Dr. Joe Mercola had yeah. his bank account shut down. Everyone that worked for him had his account shut down, and the people that worked for him's families got their account shut down. Uh, and this was just uh, six months ago. This stuff happens all the time. Um, so it's really they're really trying to protect uh, people's. Uh, privacy and uh, freedom to transact and not specifically the word CBDC, I guess is what you're saying. Yeah, I think that's the big that's the big message here is protect people's right to transact, protect people's privacy, and that CBDCs would dramatically tear down those those institutions. All right, last topic real quick. I know we gotta we gotta wrap this up, but back to um, sort of the comments that you made, and I'm agreeing with that we're seeing the the tide shifting, right? We're seeing momentum swinging, which again is ridiculous. Of course, we should have freedom to transact uh, as we see fit, but at least we're we're starting to see that um, politically starting to swing back that way. Uh, we talked about sort of Elizabeth Warren and Gary Gensler have been seemingly very aggressive against uh, our freedom to transact with crypto and digital assets and Bitcoin, et cetera. Um, and maybe some of that's starting to shift as well. Do you think the yesterday's news of the um, Ethereum ETF getting approved, um, the spot ETF being approved, is that like Gary Gensler realizing that he's lost the war and he's just got to throw the towel in? I mean, is this like really a big signpost that like, hey, Warren, uh, Gensler, get out of the way, like we're moving forward? Or what's your take on that? And what does that mean in the, in the greater context of things? Yeah, I think that's a big capitulation. And uh, in some ways could be seen as an SEC pivot. Could Where that came from, I think will um, will be really important where that order came from, so to speak. I don't know if that was a decision by Gary Gensler himself. I don't know if that was something that was from on high, the Biden administration or the Warren camp, but ultimately that's a level of, of, of capitulation or, or pivoting on the issue, right? We Everyone was saying 25% chance at best of an Ethereum ETF getting through and not someone, I, listen, I'm not living, my, my day isn't getting ruined necessarily if an Ethereum ETF doesn't get approved, but it does. Again, I think the important message here is it highlights how much things are changing and how much the momentum has shifted to the side of the broader digital asset ecosystem. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to see the way it's the way it's played out. Uh, don't can't tell you, can't read minds. Uh, I don't think anybody really knows yet. But ultimately, it is a very positive sign and and a momentum builder for the space to see this uh, to see it get passed. All right. All right. Um, well, we got a couple minutes left. If you want to just say, like, uh, obviously, Satoshi Action Fund is out there on the forefront. Uh, do you want to talk about anything like initiatives that you're working on, like big things that are maybe in the works, things that people should be paying attention to? Absolutely. You know, you mentioned debanking just a moment ago, and that is an issue that we care deeply about at Satoshi Action. We see folks in the Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, digital asset space being debanked at rates. I mean, I've never seen in my lifetime. I've never even heard of historically. 
uh, and we want to make sure that we put an end to the banking. And there are three major components to you know the powers that be in the banking world. That is the OCC, it's the federal regulator for banks. It's the FDIC, those are the guys that do the insurance for your bank account. And then there's the Fed. They have the Fed master accounts. We did a lot of research. We put out a big paper on this. I encourage people to go look it up on our website, satoshiaction.io, under our policy section, under debanking. Uh, and it really highlights how the major point, the major choke point for anyone is the Fed master account because the Fed has godlike power over who gets a Fed master account. You don't need to look any further than Caitlin Long and Custodia to know that they were denied a Fed master account. In my opinion, I think it was pretty obvious. It was done in a discriminatory fashion. And so we are, we put forward this paper saying, this is the problem. The Fed master accounts are the problem. How do we solve this problem? And I believe that we solve it by having states have their own Fed master accounts. And we're already on the pathway to showing that that can be truly successful. Uh, the, the state of Texas already has its own Fed master account. Uh, North Dakota already has a state bank with its own Fed master account. So we don't even need to pass legislation to see if this thing will work. We really just need to take that under that knowing that we have those Fed master accounts and say, okay, let's position this industry underneath that Fed master account and see what the federal government is going to try to come after the states. Because at the end of the day, if they try to come after states' powers to bank a, an industry and their own Fed master account, you are just like striking right at the heart of constitutional powers that are given to the states, the dual banking system. And if you do that, you are going to see the fastest tracked uh, banking uh, la lawsuit get to the Supreme Court in a matter of time. And I think with the current makeup, that Supreme Court would definitely side that dual banking still exists in America. And if that happens, we essentially end debanking in the United States overnight. Now you talk about the Fed master account and that's like you referenced Caitlin Long, who's been on the show a couple of times and she's trying to get a bank through and they won't give her the, the ability or they won't pass, uh, they won't, they won't license that to go through. But when you talk about debanking, like in Dr. Joe McCullough's case, for example, it was the commercial bank that shut his account down. So, I mean, are you, say, are you saying that came from the Fed? Like, hey, commercial banks shut his account down, but it seems like the decision was made at the lower level because he was able to get other banks. Listen, the banks are businesses. Why would a bank not want you to come do business with them? It's because the federal regulators are applying undue pressure on banks to debank those people that they don't politically agree with, that they don't align with, or that they, don't, they think is a competition to their banking system, right? So the way this works is the FDIC says, hey, I'm gonna raise your rates if you bank this industry, uh, you, know, you better watch out. And then the, the banks themselves are like, well, we don't wanna deal with that. Or the Fed or someone else in the regulatory space, like we're gonna audit you if you don't, if you don't get rid of these crypto people. See, they're, they're safe, that they're unsafe, they're not sound. So we're gonna have to audit you a little bit more and that's gonna bring your costs up. So it's very pervasive the way that it's taking place. But at the end of the day, the, that ultimate power at the Fed master accounts is the one that you hone in on because you can get away from the FDIC, right? You can say, I don't want insurance at my bank. I'm gonna just do uh, fully reserve back 100%, 105% like Caitlin Long. Um, you can also, in the case of the OCC, which is the, the federal regulator for banks, you can say, well, I don't wanna be federally regulated. I wanna be regulated by my state. I'm gonna be a state charter bank. So you can avoid those two regulators, but you cannot avoid the Fed master account. It is impossible. You have to have either direct access to a Fed master account, or you have to bank with an intermediary bank um, where, or your bank that you want to go to that say like offers crypto services has to go to an intermediary bank and say, Hey, you have a Fed master account. Let me use your settlement process with the Fed in order to ensure that I can uh, not only bank these people, but still, you know, get everything cleared out. Uh, but the, that is a situation where those, even those intermediary banks are saying, we don't want to touch anything. We don't want to touch other banks that are crypto in the crypto industry because we're going to get pressure applied to us by that, you know, that federal banking mafia system that's been created over the, over the, the decades and over the last hundred years, really. Um, so that's really where the, the problem is, is that if you try to bank this space, then you're going to run into one of those problems. And even if you try to eliminate the two, the FDIC and the OCC, you simply cannot eliminate that choke point at the Federal Reserve. Good stuff, Dennis. I know we got to wrap this up. You're on your way to a nice little vacation, so I don't want to hold you back from that. But I do want to just kind of shout out a, just a little challenge just to the audience. Um, again, I was just uh, seeing Jordan Peterson live uh, last week with my daughter. He was amazing, as always. And at the end, he talked about how, uh, and really his message has always been that we should all take personal responsibility for ourselves. 
And that's always been his message. Like pull yourself up from bootstraps, wipe your face off, like take responsibility for yourself. And he talks about um, the difference of tyranny and slavery and how they're sort of opposite sides. And the slave doesn't want to take personal responsibility for themselves. They're just always being told what to do. And the problem is that he says that specifically in regards to the way the world is working and in politics and in specific specificity. Um, if we don't step up and take personal responsibility for ourselves, and we don't step up and take personal responsibility for our our political system, our local politics, and maybe on a bigger level, if we don't step up and take responsibility for that, then the tyrants will. So by abdicating our responsibility, uh, that leaves a vacuum, the tyrants will come and pick that up. And so uh, his challenge is be responsible, not just for yourself, but for your community and for your um, and for the political system as well, if you care. And to be honest with you, Dennis, uh, I heard him say this. This is the second time I heard him say this, and it's just like, oh, it's like, man, it's like he's he's absolutely right. So I applaud what you're doing, um, and I recommend everybody go check out Satoshi Action Fund. If you uh, can't, if you don't have the time, maybe you can at least support them in some way. Um, anything else you want to say in closing, Dennis? No, uh, thank you again for having me on, Mark. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll finish with a with a great Plato quote. Uh, you know, one of the penalties for refusing to participate in politics is that you end up being governed by your inferiors. So it's true. You, I know a lot of people don't want to engage in the political system. They don't like it. It's gross. But if you just say, hey, I'm going to abdicate that responsibility. I'm not going to get involved. Somebody's going to get involved and they're going to end up making rules that you have to follow. So I always tell people, you know, if you want to make sure that America uh, upholds its values and that we had the right direction, that there's no better way to do that than to get involved in the political process. Awesome. All right, Dennis, always a pleasure. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Mark.